There we go. So hi everyone and welcome to Lanarkshire Family History Society's webinar for May. My name is Claire Wilson and I will be your host this evening. Uh, we would be obliged if you would turn off your cameras and your sound until the presentation is over. It just helps to keep the background noise to a minimum, allows everyone to enjoy the webinar and hopefully, fingers crossed, there'll be no delays or any screens freezing as well. Please pop a note into the chat box and tell us where you're watching from today. Um, also tell us what you're researching and if you've had any interesting finds. Uh, I'm just going to quickly um, mention the, the genealogy summer sessions. Let me just see if I can share my screen. Yep, so Christine, um, who you all know, can't be with me tonight, um, but Christine and myself have arranged the, the Kilted Ancestors genealogy summer sessions. Um, so this leads on from the Kilted Culture Conferences that we did last year, but rather than doing four, you know, full afternoon conferences, you know, over the year, we thought what we would do is arrange some summer sessions during the month of July. Um, so they all last about an hour and the cost is £10 for all four sessions. So, I mean, the price, less than the price of a coffee per session. Um, I think that works out about 17 Canadian dollars or 12 US dollars. They take place over Zoom and don't worry if you can't make it on the day, the recordings will be available for 30 days thereafter. Um, so the first event's on Monday the 10th of July uh, with myself and it's getting organised with a little help from Trello. If you're like me and you have lists all over the place and spreadsheets with lots of things to do, Trello is a great way for getting organised. So I'll deep dive you into what Trello is, what it's about and how you can use it for your research. Uh, Monday the 17th of July, Christine will be doing a presentation on blogging your family history. This is an amazing way to share the research that you're doing. Um, people often find it very difficult to know the best way to, to, to share it with family members. So um, she actually does this at the moment and she's going to show you how, how, best, how best to do it and what websites you can use to do it as well. And then Monday the 24th of July, I'll be doing Pinterest for genealogy. Um, and I think, you know, when you think about Pinterest, you think about people saving recipes, wedding ideas, you know, tips for your house, whatever else. Um, it is a great way of bookmarking websites, obviously genealogy websites, because, you know, how many times do you find a website and then can't find it again? Um, but also it's a great way to create things like memorial boards, um, and also to find family history handouts and activity sheets for kids and all sorts of other things. And then the last one on Monday the 31st of July is save, organise and share your family memories. Um, it, Christine's going to show you how to use permanent cloud storage to save and organise photos, documents, recipes, stories, old movies, so that they're not lost for future generations. Um, so as I said, it's £10 for all four sessions. It will be very interactive rather than being sort of on a, a kind of conference basis. Um, and that, you know, each as we go through each session, we'll reflect on the previous one and see how people are getting on, perhaps share things that you've been doing yourself. And yeah, so it's going to be really interactive. So we're quite looking forward to that. And I'll place details into the chat or where you can sign up for it as well. Um, spaces are limited, so what I would say is get in quick uh, before the this, this spaces run out. If you're not already a member of Lanarkshire Family History Society, then why not join now? Annual membership ranges from 10 to 16 pounds. You receive three journals per year, monthly e-news, and also use of the Society's Research Centre in Motherwell. You can find out more via the link that I will put in the chat box. Uh, the next Allied Air Force Research webinar that I run myself uh, takes place on Wednesday the 31st of May. Uh, it will feature a presentation by Andy Burge on Operation Black Buck 1982 
the Vulcans, extraordinary Falklands war raids. Um, I don't really, you know, it's funny because I don't, when you think of history, you don't really think of the Falklands War as being history because I think most of us can actually remember it. But it recently was the 40th anniversary and there are so many books now being published on the subject. So you can attend this webinar for free and I will put details in the chat box for where you can sign up for that as well. So as the weather improves for all of us and the lighter nights are starting to come in as well, thank God, um, it's a perfect time to get out into the graveyards and hunt down the burial places of our ancestors. And with that in mind, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Colin Mackey of Friends of the Southern Necropolis. Friends of the Southern Necropolis are a group of volunteers who have a passion for, for preserving and promoting the many historical educational and environmental assets of the Godbold's very own city of the dead. Tonight, Colin, aka the Happy Reaper, we'll ask him about that in a minute, <laughs> will take us on an online visual, um, an online visual and mental meander through some of the history and characters of the cemetery. The Southern Necropolis is the final resting place of approximately 250,000 contributors to the rich historical legacy of the Gorbals and Glasgow. And I'm quite proud to say actually that some of my relatives happen to be in there as well. Colin, um, you can unmute yourself now. How are you? Oh, you're still mute. Yep, you hear me all right? Yep. Yeah, I'm How good, thanks. You? Yeah, you've got. You've, I believe you've got answers. I, I, I keep looking for the all the elephant stone, but I, yeah. it's one of the ones in a cemetery. It's twenty acres. I've, I've said to a lot of folk, I think I've seen that somewhere. So it's, I've, I've got the number. I managed to look. So good. I, yeah, I went to the Mitchell Library a while ago. Brilliant. I had on microfilm um, the burial records. Right. I think I went back the next time, and they said, "Oh no, it's damaged. You can't actually view it." Yeah. Um, but I did find the, 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 the layer number. So, yeah, I'll get it and I'll email it to you and maybe we can... Get it to me because we've, we've been quite lucky the last couple, the last few weeks. Uh, we've had a few, few people getting in touch and it's always ha really quite good when you get a stone because it's a 50-50 chance to actually get a monument on it and we've been quite lucky. So, if you get me the number, then fingers crossed. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. Maybe meet up with you there. That'd be good. Definitely, definitely. So, I'll, I'll hand over to you, Colin, um, like you shared your presentation. Right, no problem at all. So I'm just going to share my screen. And if anybody's got any questions for Colin, you can ask them at the end, or if you want, you can pop them in the chat box as well. <laughs> okay, I actually, uh, good, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's myself, Colin Mackey, from the Friends of Selling Acropolis. And as Claire said, I've, I've adopted, I've been given the nickname over the last... Uh, 35 years connection with the Southern Acropolis of uh, I've kind of earned the name of the Happy Reaper because I tend to do a kind of my tours and either online or, or physically at the cemetery. I kind of adopt a kind of I always believe and I've, I've developed it. And I think a lot of people develop it. You got linked with cemeteries, a kind of graveyard sense of humour. And uh, unfortunately for you tonight, my, my wife's away out tonight with her friends, so she's not here to shut me up. But then Claire can always just switch me off and mute me. Um, generally when I go on my tours if you come to the cemetery it, it tends to last a wee bit longer than most people think in a nice way because um, I go on wee tangents because I take people on journeys because I believe first and foremost the Southern Acropolis is a final resting place it is a burial ground but at the end of the day it's a celebration of life as well uh, there's many stories in it in fact my t-shirt this is my t-shirts that we've got and the logo on it says every stone tells a story and as, as yourselves, if you know into genealogy, etc., headstones and cemetery records are a very, very vital and unique res, uh, resource for, for research. Uh, especially headstones are kind of permanent kind of uh, record cards, if you like, for, for to the past. And we always believe it's we're always even to the day we're still finding out stories. And especially um, during COVID, just back there. <laughs> we've, all, we've all come through it. A lot of folk turn to genealogy and, we, and obviously with the, 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 the access to online stuff. So a lot of people started looking for the family trees. And a few years ago, when the programme Air Hunters was on the telly, people were starting to think, I'm going to start doing my family tree. I might, I might have money lying somewhere. 
But I've always told folk, I can offer sometimes work the opposite. You might owe tax for land somewhere, so it, it works and it doesn't work, sort of thing. But generally, um, we're really quite uh, up for people coming to the cemetery and anybody that's found anything. We've got learn maps, et cetera. And we can always try and do our best. If, if not, we can link you up with people. We've got lots of contacts through, through um, different websites and, and groups, et cetera. So just tonight to give you a wee insight into the, the Southern Necropolis and hopefully in the future, as Claire was saying, the weather's getting better. We do uh, monthly, uh, we've got some funding for monthly tour talk in a cuppa, and we do it at the end of the month. We've got one coming up in, in May, and the next one has moved on to the first week in July. For, we had to change it. And you basically get a wee walk. It's on a Sunday. You get a walk in the cemetery, and after that, you get a wee cup of tea and a sandwich and a wee gab. And it's amazing the amount of people that meet up and start to talk about different interests and things. And and, must, and another thing people like to find is when you see their surname or their full name on a headstone, because that's quite a, a unique opportunity to see what it looks like in writing. Because you might see it and you might know. You never know. It. Wherever you believe you go, you might get a view at it, but it's ideal to see it at the time. But again, we're always welcome visitors to come down. So just to give you a wee insight tonight into some of the history and heritage of the Southern Necropolis, uh, I've been connected with the cemetery for the last 35 years, and I was employed as a research officer on the very first Southern Necropolis research project back in 1988, and it was set up by a lady called Charlotte Hutt. So I'm going to take you through, I'll take you to the first couple of slides. I'm going to move this wee box because I can't even see what I'm reading. There we go. There we are. It's better. I like this wee quote that I found a few years ago. Uh, the mark of a Scot of all classes is that he or she remembers and cherishes the memories of his forebearers, good or bad, and here burns alive in them a sense of identity with the dead, even to the 20th generation. Basically, your ancestors, your, the past, every every tree, family tree, history tree, whatever, it's, it's, it's really good if it's got strong roots and we always promote that um, with people that's doing family history. And again, the Southern Necropolis has been is in the cemetery, has been established in 1840, and it's a strong, a strong historical route to the Gorbals area and it's in its own right. The, the Southern Necropolis, the past and pioneering project back in 1988. I was employed in a project by this this lady, sadly, Charlotte Hutt, she died a few years back. Charlotte was a, an English guidance teacher in Adelphi Secondary School that I went to in the Gorbals. Charlotte kind of dealt with children that were going off the, off the rails a wee bit or just children that were generally having, having bothered at school and she set, them, she set them back on the track again or she helped them to do it. But Charlotte had a strong passion for the Gorbals. She was originally a teacher in um, Cran Hill and she came down to the Gorbals and she fell in love with the place and she was very, very, very passionate about it along with people like Jeff Shaw and Lilith Graham, etc. Charlotte always flew the flag for the Gorbals and uh, I went to many a meeting with Charlotte and uh, I, was, I've asked, I was asked to walk out of many a meeting by Charlotte when Charlotte was going to lose her temper but she was getting fed up with people quoting the No Mean City book. I went, oh, you come, you, you, you're teaching the Gorbals. That's just that No Mean City. And Charlotte would usually turn around and say, Colin, I think you'd like to leave at this part. And I would leave and Charlotte would kind of, how do I put it? Charlotte would kind of verbally set them set them straight about the passion in the community of the Gorbals. It was started in 1988 and was a considered a suitable contribution to the then City of Culture celebrations way back in 1990. My goodness, if you think back to then, in the very, very early years, if not just starting of the internet, at that time the graveyard was sadly neglected, the stones were falling into bits, and if it wasn't recorded at that time, it would probably become unrecordable in the future. With this in mind, our project was set up to focus on preserving the rich history within it and at least bring it back into people's memory. We had a, an idea at the start when we started that uh, we knew basically that Greek Thompson was in there and we knew that Sir Thomas Lipton was buried in the cemetery, but we didn't, know, we didn't really know about just how much history we would find as the years moved forward. And as I say, to this day, we're still, I, I would like to say we're still digging up history, but not literally. So don't quote me on that. This is original. I always think this is like an Untouchables photograph. If any have seen the Untouchables, where are they now kind of photo? That's myself and the team there. That's me there. Uh, we've got John Calder, a researcher, Mitch Carr, Robert Collett and Tony Devlin, who is a good friend of mine. He was a photographer on the project. 
that was back when people actually had to develop their own photographs in a dark room. You didn't have to go and just take your SD card and go and stick it in anywhere. Tony had to take photographs of all the headstones. He recorded most of them, used a wee measuring stick at the side. We chopped both for the number and then go along all the rows individually. To, and Tony loved to use the word laborious. So a laborious, pro, a laborious but needed process, and he did quite a lot of work in, in the process of it, developing the photographs as well. The, the big column behind us, that's still there. I keep meaning to get a then and now photograph, but the column's still there to this day. That stone there, if you can see my wee arrow, you can see the cursor, okay, I hope. That stone is actually lying face down, face up, sorry, at the moment. And the rest of us, we're still, we're still, we're still here. Basically, I'm still here. Tony's very heavily involved in the Gorbos. He's a, uh, he's a drummer in the St. Francis Pipe Band and he teaches a chanter as well. Uh, John Calder, I think, is a teacher in Knightswood. Mitch Kerr, uh, he works in the Outlander Productions and he builds the sets and dismantles the sets. And my good friend Robert Corlett is the owner of Mr. Ben's Vintage Clothing Shop in, uh, in King, King's Court in Glasgow City Centre. So we're all still we're all still ticking away. But that was the team, me proudly standing with my denims on and my clipboard in hand, ready to go and start researching the Southern Acropolis. That's me, I had to, I had to put my camera on a tripod, but it's a, a lovely photograph. One day we'll get the gang together and get another photograph. And no doubt a lot more of us with either no hair or grey hair. One of the two. One of the two. Joe Fisher, when I went to the Mitchell Library back in the day, Joe Fisher was head of the Glasgow Room. A lot of you might remember Joe Fisher, a beautiful, very, very knowledgeable man. Got to know Joe very well. And he published the Glasgow Encyclopedia book as well. Joe died a few years back, but he was there when we went into the Mitchell Library. We got a Carell, a wee office in it that we used to go up and do our research in. And his quote was, certainly nothing been done like it in Glasgow. The project is pioneering work. A great deal of research has gone into it by various members of the team. I've seen it myself. For instance, the team had to start reading medical textbooks of 1850s because a great many of the diseases that people have died of either don't now exist or have a different name. That was a great experience for us in the Mitchell Library. A group of Gorbo's boys going up to the up to the Mitchell Library and being let loose at records and the burial books and I totally fell in love with the place. Uh, Robert or Rab, my supervisor at the time, he fell in love with um, um, what you call it, the, the, the diseases in books, autopsies and stuff, and all different kind of things he read up, and graphic kind of drawing books and textbooks about causes of death, etc. And they get quite heavily uh, researched a lot of this stuff, and we built a small database up. Uh, the last count we came up, when we stopped the project, it was about 160, 170 different causes of deaths. And just to warn you, I've, at the end of it, I've got a wee um, audience participation. Can I've got cause of death cards to let you see the comparisons of terminology for deaths back in the 1800s compared to what they are today. But that was Joe Fisher, a great man, a very, very knowledgeable man in the Mitchell Library. The first word, one of the first words I learned from Joe Fisher was shh. Because I was quite passionate when I started doing the research. I get quite carried away sometimes in the Mitchell Library when you found somebody quite notable. Because a lot of the burial books, as you know, down, some of them down the columns have got occupations. And when you hit one, it said architect or something to that nature. You get quite excited. And I would generally shout over to Rab or Tony or something on the other side of the room. Rab, I found, I found Charles Wilson. And it was Mr. Mackey. Shh, this is a library. And he would do it with a big smile on his face. In fact, one of the stories that um, when Charlotte came in to visit us now and again, the first time I got a burial book put down to me, the lady came out with a cushion and put the cushion on the desk and then brought the book out. And uh, Charlotte walks in and Colin's light, sitting with his elbows on the cushion, turning the pages of the burial books. And if, uh, if they looked in Charlotte's face, she just basically, her jaw dropped and she walked over in a kind of loud whisper, if you like, Colin Mackey. That cushion is for the book. So I had to obviously lift the book up and put it on to support the spine on it, but she took it well. And we read many, many interesting video books. Uh, lots. Again, we're blessed with libraries. Libraries are something that we really promote, especially libraries with the resources like the Mitchell. 
Inscriptions, many of them in the cell of Necropolis, many kind of epitaphs as well. They're very, very quite interesting. Some can be quite um, biblical quotes, etc. This one's quite, pop <laughs> quite popular, if you can say an epitaph's popular. The death where is thy sting, or grave where is thy victory? But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Tony actually read that one. That was his favourite. We got an interview done by um, BBC Radio Scotland, came down and did an interview with us and recorded us. And um, Tony got recorded saying that. And he, I think he just cranked it up a bit because he was dead. He's very, very posh when he read it out. And he just says, Tony, you, you, you've rehearsed that. So that's, that's the, the first, the very first section of the recording. I've got it on um, one of our groups somewhere. I'll need to share it with you. It's quite an interest. It lasts for about an hour. And thankfully, it's really good. It's preserved because Charlotte Hutt's voice is on it, and Joe Fisher speaks on it as well. So for an archive, it's very important to kind of... I will try and investigate how I can share it. Epitaph. A nice wee pub question for my pronunciations here. Is late Middle English from Old French epitaphe via Latin from Greek epitaphium, funeral oration, neuter of epitaphius over or at a tomb from epi meaning upon and taphus meaning tomb from the OxfordDictionaries.com. So if you go on the chase and you win a lot of money and that question comes up and that's the one that gets you the money, remember our gatehouse needs some repairs done yet, so keep us in mind. But it's a handy wee, a wee, a wee kind of bit of information for you to know. For those of you who haven't been to the cell on the Acropolis, why not? You need to come down for a visit. Keep it in mind in the future, the weather's getting better. As Claire said, you're more than welcome to pop down. This is an aerial view from the high-rise flats. And this will be a historical view in a couple of years as well, folks, because the high-rise flats in Caledonia Road, there's only two of them left, and they're coming down. People have been moved out at the moment, and they'll be getting picked down. They're not going to get dem demolished as in with dynamite. They're going to get picked down in levels, and they'll be down within the next year and a half to two years, so they will no, no longer be there. So they'll be a bit of history. This is looking down in the western section of the cell and the Acropolis. Looking over to the top of the picture is this, the new Crown Street Retail Park. To the right-hand side, I hope you can see my, my, uh, my arrow there. If any of you can see it, give it a wee thumbs up. I hope you can see it. Is it yep, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Dot. This is City Refrigeration, Wally Hockey's business. And this is up here as a retail park, which is currently got the biggest pound land in Scotland. <laughs> we're, we're claiming to fame. We've got the biggest pound land in Scotland. Well, most of the stuff isn't a pound, but we'll not go there. And this is the Western section. This was established in 1840. And just about here, you can't see it for the trees, is the final resting place of Alexander Greek Thompson. And up here, where Arrow is, is our Commonwealth Corner, which I'll show you in a minute. Again, you can get an idea about the quarter of a million burials. This is just a, this is the largest section of the cemetery. Uh, Central section was the first one that opened in 1840, sorry, and the eastern 1846, and the western here, these four quarters, was 1850. Up at the back here, this is known as the South Terrace. It's a grassed area, but there are burials in here as well. There's about five double rows in this section. Then down at the front, on this grass bit, which is now a natural meadow area, this is called the North Terrace, very posh. And there's burials in this bit as well. Again, roughly four or five double rows of burials. So, again, it gives you an idea and insight into just how we come up with the approximation of burials in it. It's a lovely cemetery. And, again, it's it's seasonal. It's, it's a green space at the end of the day, and it changes with the seasons. At the moment, the wild cherry trees up the central section path have blossomed, and the blossoms are falling off. And I get in there for my lunch. I go, I go to cemetery for my lunch. I work in a nursery. I'm a nursery teacher and I walk across in the afternoon at my lunch break and the blossoms is falling down and it's like, that, it's like Mother Nature snow. It's so nice. It's a beautiful place. A man named Gilmore. A Mr. William Gilmore. The land of the cell and Acropolis where, it's bait, where, it's, where it was set up. Uh, this is a drawing from 1849. The land belonged to a man, a, a merchant called William Gilmore who stayed in, a, in Oatland's house, which was a villa, a small villa, just off of Caledonia Road in the Gorbals. And he owned the lands that uh, the cemetery is, was founded on. And his son-in-law was Colin Sharp McLaws. And Colin Sharp McLaws and his friend Archibald Edmondson 
approach William Gilmore uh, with an inquiry of a possibly purchasing some land for setting up uh, a burial ground. Uh, they did a, a kind of like prospectus in 1849 in the Gorbals Baronial Halls to see if anybody would turn up and uh, be interested in basically uh, subscribing to a cemetery. And they were overwhelmed with people coming up because back in the day, the, the prospects of a pit burial or a pauper's grave, etc. a lot of folk thought this was a great idea. Plus the fact when William Gilmore agreed for the lands to be purchased, he stipulated, I've done research on it and I've seen minute books, he stipulated that the, the burials be affordable to the working classes with an instalment payment system. So William Gilmore was a very, very, very early funeral plan person. So basically your ancestor could go along and for a set, I think it was six, pen, six pennies or whatever, or you would agree on a payment system and you would go to the cemetery once a week and you pay X amount of money and once you reached a certain amount, you'd be quite liable to start burying people in a layer. Again, your ancestor would have an access to in a specific layer with a number, which was an, an, a great opportunity for people, especially the working classes. This drawing, we believe, was possibly drawn by Charles Wilson, the architect, because it's on a document that has a drawing also done by him. And as you can see here, anybody that knows the Gorbals, this is Caledonia Road right in front of the gatehouse. We know it's 18, about 1849 because central section was 1840. Eastern section up here was opened in 1846 and the gatehouse was built in 1848-49. So the drawing kind of explains it. There's a little, a little funeral going in, carriages and stuff. You can see there's ornate kind of like hedge, hedged archways over the paths. They don't exist anymore, but if we get any extra funding in the future, who knows, they might return. But you can see that was it starting to the, the city of the dead and the gorbals were starting to expand already from 1840 to 1846. This is a map of the gorbals at that time and Oatlands. And here's Oatlands House. Any of you know the gorbals history? At this little gusset, we'll call it a gusset, between Caledonia Road and Rilligan Road was in the future that would, would have been come after the mansion. It would have become St Bonaventure's Church. I run a wee page in uh, Facebook called Oatlands Memories. I've got about a thousand members. I've got loads of photographs on it donated by people and St Bonaventure's Church would have sat right there. It was pulled down a few years ago and it's been lying there as grass for so many years. It makes me really upset to think, why did they not just leave it? It was a beautiful building. It would have made a lovely heritage centre or something, but they pulled it down and it's been grass for as long as I can remember. So that's the Oatlands Mansions there, Oatlands House. It's also known as Oatlands Villa and the gardens next to it. My friend, Jackie, who's a member, a volunteer and friends of, I keep saying to Jackie, her house sits right there at the second little tree. So her veranda's there. So every time I go and see her, I say, you do realise you're sitting in William Gilmore's garden. So William Gilmore was a man that owned all the land, a very, very wealthy man. One of the founders of the Clydesdale Bank, he had money and in everything, insurance companies, et cetera, et cetera. But looking at his minutes and his writings, he had a conscience because he also stipulated that when they extended it in 1846 to the eastern section, that money would have been set by for an orphanage school, or an orphan school, sorry, eh, for children who lost family members. But sadly, when he died in 1849, for some reason or other, I don't know, the guys that ran the cemetery either didn't do it or they forgot to do it. And the school never gets set up. So, but again, a, a good insight into the man having a conscience for other people. That's a drawing again. A very, very, very rare drawing of Oatlands House. It's kind of like a very small mansion with a little annexed house or a wee garden area next to it. A wee boat that's opposite. That's the bend at Richmond Park on the other side over here. So this is the green here. And that's the bend just at the park across at the Gorbo side in Oatlands. We've always tried to find out what William Gilmore looked like. And my annoying thing is a lot of you know when you do research, you start to get hints about people. There's a cracking website. I don't know if you've have used it before. If you want to take a note, I can let Claire know. I think I've said to Claire before. It's archive.org, which is an American-based um research, it's, a, it's a, a, an online library and it's amazing. Uh, you can register with them for free. 
you can take books out online, you can go back to them, you can keep them out for so many days because a lot of books are quite popular. And basically, <clears throat> if you want, now and again, they'll, they'll get in touch with you. For a small donation through um, PayPal of $5 or whatever, to keep the, there's thousands and millions of people use it. I found lots of stuff. The old um, post office directories for Glasgow are on it. There's books on it that I mean, you wouldn't even believe. There's recorded meetings from different organisations. There's newspapers, there's books. Uh, they just recently set up or flagged up a section on it, which has got a lot of old advertisement posters on it. And I found a cracking comic strip um, advertising Sir Thomas Lipton's tea and how it can make you feel energy. And it's a man and his wife go to a, a farmer's market and they're very tired. And the wife says, why don't we try some Lipton's tea? And at the last caption, they've drunk it and they're all happy and they're dancing about. But there's loads of adverts on it and some of them look quite nice in frames, by the way, but it's a lot. Archive.org, give it a little try. I found this on it and it annoyed me really, really much. It was from a, a catalogue of an, an art exhibition in the city chambers, I'm sure it was, uh, artists from Glasgow and surrounding areas. And, it, and article number 220 was a William Gilmore of Oaklands and my eyes lit up. I went, oh my goodness me. He was born in Denny in 1777, died at Oatlands in 1848. He was a merchant, a councillor from 1832 to 39, magistrate of the city and JP for the county of Lanark, preceptor of Hutchison's Hospital for many years, a director of the merchant's house of the Royal Infirmary and House of Refuge. He took a deep interest in most of the charitable institutions of Glasgow. He was a very busy, really, I mean, the guy was minted, definitely. And the painter was William Wallace after the original by Daniel McNeigh. RSA. Now, the annoying thing is, folks, there's another bit con connected to this, and it tells you the lady's address that donated the picture for the, the exhibition, and her address was on it, and she stayed in Newlands. And I tried to check up, but she obviously doesn't stay there anymore. And I thought, there's a there's a patent out there. But somebody told me from them, um, I got in touch with somebody through a website for art, uh, Scottish art. He said it might just be something like Man at a Window man smoking a pipe or something, they might not have his, but I'm thinking if his name's on it, it must be out there somewhere. So maybe one night when I'm watching the Antiques Roadshow, if somebody comes on and says, I've got this picture of a man called William Gilmer, I don't know who he is, I'll be still on that phone because it's out there. But if you find it, folks, take a note. I'm looking for William Gilmer and I very much appreciate if you ever find any images of the man. Be very interested to see. Again, he's quoted in a lot of these are all documents that's come off of archive.org and it mentions William Gilmore. The Fire and Life Insurance Company of Scotland was involved in that and his family were big in different um, businesses as well. William Gilmore of and Company House Oatlands Little Govan. A mine of information in and I say archive.org has been really, really useful for me finding out stuff. And the British newspaper archives, you, you obviously know about that one. That's been a great... My wife... Um, Elsie gets quite annoyed. She's well, not annoyed, but she knows if I'm up to two in the morning and I'm on the internet, she knows I'm just looking for dead people. So she, she doesn't get very much worried. She genuinely shouts in at the end of the week, you need to get your bed, you've got work in the morning. But you know what it's like, you, you, you get a lead and you want to follow it. Right, so we followed a lead. And guess who we found in the Northern Necropolis? Mr. William Gilmore and family. Was I disappointed? No disrespect. I thought he'd have been buried in the Southern Necropolis, but the man had cash. And again, I never believe in coincidence, my wife will tell you. The member of our group, Julia Kenny from Canada, got in touch with us many years ago. And I met Julia, she's come over, she's coming over in June again. And she did a lot of family history. She's got, uh, like Claire, she's got a lot of folk buried in the Southern Necropolis, it's a family tree. But guess who she's related to? Guess who is her great? Great, great, great grandfather, William Gilmore. And I was very happy, but very disappointed at the same time. She's not got any money. She's done research and she's not, but thankfully for her, there's no back taxes for the Southern Necropolis or Oakland's land. So she's all right, but that's amazing. We were so chuffed. She said, I'm related. That's my great. And I was like, no way. So she gave us a learn number. And like a lot of you during COVID, when you get a wee hour, half hour to go out visiting places, I went to a cemetery. And we went to the Northern Necropolis, my wife and I, to find the grave of William Gilmore. Now, at the time, 
there was a lot of people walking about. Social distancing was the was the big thing then. And people stopped and stared because they heard this guy with glasses on shouting out quite loud, Elsie, I found William Gilmore. My wife came shuffling me around the corners. Where is it? Up at this big podium, but right below the shadow of John Knox. So just up here, where my arrow is, up this bit there is the other level, and right at the back there is John Knox. And William Gilmore has got one, two, three, or four big wall stones donated, dedicated to his family, and they're buried up there. So he looks right over to the cathedral. He's got a cracking view of the city, by the way. He can probably see the Southern Necropolis. Maybe that's why he went up there. I never thought of that. Maybe he wanted a view of the Southern Necropolis, but I was so happy. And the people are laughing because they see, they see I was wearing a jumping for joy. Uh, it was so good. So we know where he is. Again, a wee bit of monumental symbolism on the gravestones, the headstones, sorry. The, the downtown torches kind of represents a life that's extinguished. Sometimes you get torches that are up, kind of like signifying a vibrant life. But again, the man had money and uh, money talks, so he's buried up in the northern necropolis. And there's the necropolis prospectus that was sent out in 1839 for the setting up of, a uh, proposed setting up of a burial ground in the Gorbals. The old Gorbals burial ground, which is a rose garden and orchard just now, predates the southern necropolis because it was set up in 1715. But obviously that was a smaller cemetery, so they needed something. As the, as the Gorbals expanded, obviously, more people move into an area, more people die, so they needed somewhere bigger. And the southern necropolis was set up. As I'm always amazed, like yourselves, to this day, the amount of documents that people tend to find or have through family history, and they send us to them or they bring them with them. And it's so, I mean, it's a testament to people that's, that's doing research and kept a lot of stuff. That's a section. One quarter of the central section. Uh, this is a gatehouse. When you come down for a visit, see how it's kind of inviting you when you come down. That's the gatehouse in Caledonia Road. You'll walk in and this is a quarter of the, This is just a quarter of the central section. Every one of these boxes is a grave with up to about five to seven people in it. Uh, there are different price bands in it. 21 shillings, 36 and 9, 52 and 6. And the wall stones were £9 to £12. A lot of that was to do with the depth of the grave, plus the fact that we believe that, like any other business, and the selling the crop was, was a business, as you start getting busy and making money, you tend to can sometimes put the price up, and that would have maybe explained a lot of that as well. This circle there, as you walk straight up, is known as the Franciscan Circle. And right on that bit there where my arrow is, my wife, I've always got to mention this, my wife and I were married there in 2015. We got special permission from Glasgow City Council. Uh, I think they were quite surprised when I phoned up and asked them. And John Downs for bereavement services. Uh, everything was, lying, was depending on having the, the wedding. We needed his go-ahead. I uh, phoned him on a Friday and he says, can you phone me back Monday and I'll let you know. And we had a lot of things resting on this. So I phoned him back on the Monday and he said, right, I've got, I've got something to tell you. My wife was talking to me and I thought, well, what's your wife got to do with this? She says, you're not to get married, you're off your head. But um, we got permission and we had a great day in the Southern Acropolis. It was a beautiful venue. The sun shone. It was a great day. Again, one of the dreams, of Char one of the wishes of Charlotte Hutt for our uh, prospectus was for the future, for corporate events and tours and weddings. So we've had a wedding in it. So if anybody ever looks for looking for a unique venue, give us a shout because we know how to run a wedding. No problem at all. We've done it before. Little quotes that come up when I do many tours in the Southern Acropolis. Lots of questions comes up, lots of kind of comments. Uh, what A lot of the stuff we do when we find stones for people and we actually manage to locate them Lucky if you've got a stone, a lot of the times, sometimes they can, you can find them when they're face down. And we kind of come up with this Glasgow Latin term, Tostalis Buttersidonis, which basically means if you're unlucky, your headstone's lying butterside down. And that's basically a way, unless you can get somebody professional to turn it over. Don't be tempted to try it yourself with a couple of friends because it won't work. And it's dangerous, basically. You can lose your fingers or you can... We've told somebody before who's come and got in touch with me, actually went and got some people to do it. Again, you can damage a stone. If there's a crack in that stone, if it's slate or whatever, and you try and lift it, 
if it's wet and it's embedded in the soil, you try and lift it, you can crack it and you can maybe even lose the inscription. So just be careful. Never believe in coincidence in cemeteries. Again, as I told you, Julia Kenny, um, turning out to be an ancestor of William Gilmore, and I've met many people who just happened to be in the cemetery when I was there, and they've been looking for somebody, and I've helped them to find it. The question, another point that came up in one of my tours, there's, there's records in the Mitchell Library, as you know, for burial, burial say, and one of a lot of them have got legs recorded for individuals. I brought this up, not physically, I brought this up at a topic at one of my tours, and somebody shouted from the back of the crowd, I said there was a leg buried in the cell on the crop, it's in the records, and somebody said, I was was a woman's son named Lamb. And I walked away and I went, all right, okay, get it, leg of lamb. But there are records of people's legs and different body parts. Again, one of them was the fire at Higginbotham's Mill. And sadly, the only part that was left of one of the girls was her leg, and it was quite a, it was quite a big fire, so that does happen. Paying up a lead again, again, just to highlight the fact that uh, it was like the cooperative when you played up your funeral plan and penny policies. William Gilmore was way ahead of that. And again, the man was great in suggesting that as a condition for the setting up of the cemetery, you could pay up a layer. So some of the permanent residents of the Southern Necropolis were many, 250,000. It's just going to give you an insight into some of them. Some you might know and some you might not, you might not know, sorry. What you can find in a headstone is fascinating sometimes. And I did this through the archive.org. I found this headstone just up from Charles Wilson's, William Peyton Buchan, SE. And I thought, what's SE? Is that his initials? It's in, it's in, it's in capitals. What could it be? So I went on to archive.org, typed it in, and this came up. William Peyton Buchan, SE stands for Sanitary Engineer, and it's on his headstone. And also, I use this as his, this is his claim to flame, if you get it. Cremation at Glasgow, the first cremation at the crematorium in the Western Necropolis, Glasgow, since its formal opening a few months ago, took place on Saturday. The remains were those of Mr. William Peyton Buchan, Sanitary Engineer, the very first person to, cre to be cremated up there, who had been one of the directors of the Cremation Society. There you go. And he was cremated up there on the 22nd of February, 1882, and he's famous for Buckins and just current fixed ventilator. And it was this little de drain trap at the back of your toilet. You're going to look at your toilet, it's different now, a bit of historical link. This was done to stop ob obnoxious fumes from coming in and rodents from getting back into your house. But basically, when I read up in it, the things you read up when you're doing cemeteries, the rats kind of worked out and actually found out, I think, that if you held their breath for about five seconds, they could get back into your house. But it was to sit, stop obnoxious fumes from coming back in. So that was what he did. He patented it, and he did a lot of other things for the, the, the sanitary side of Glasgow and other cities. So he's a sanitary engineer. The Crary Quarry Disaster of 1886. This is a monument. Sometimes in cemeteries, it either, you either start from the, the records or you start from a headstone and you move forward and find a story. And it's amazing just how many parts of the country and the world that a cemetery can take you on just moving on from a headstone. This is Crary Quarry and Loch Fine. And basically what happened was a lot of people used to go up there on a boat Go back, sorry. Where is it again? An annual custom, a company numbering upwards of a thousand persons, including several members of the Glasgow Corporation and their wives. They basically went up to Loch Fine on a steamer and went round to watch the, the quarry being dynamited. But at this incident, what happened was somebody suggested on the boat, why don't we go off? and walk along the shore and see the aftermath of the demolition of the explosion. And sadly, a lot of them are overcome by the fumes, and many of them just dropped like flies on the, on the, on, at the scene. And sadly, this gentleman here was one of them. And this is a Dundee Courier article, and it mentions here the gentleman's name. He was buried up there. It was the Provost Magistrate of Glasgow, uh, Councillor Duncan was interred in civic honours at the Southern Necropolis. A procession was formed 
headed by the band of the police force playing the dead march, and members of the corporation, many friends of the deceased. The funeral service was held at St George's Church, after which the cortege proceeded to the cemetery, where the crowd, estimated at about 4,000 people, witnessed the final ceremony. And that's some crowd. And again, newspaper articles are brilliant. We're really blessed again by libraries. And I've, I've used the Mitchell Library many a time with the Glasgow Herald. Some people maybe asked me in the past, could you tell me if my ancestor, same uncle David, as David Brown is buried in the Southern Acropolis, I've got the date. You might not always find it, but if you go to the the, the, the the newspapers, sometimes you get a notice of death in the paper and it might mention in it, funeral at Southern Acropolis, funeral at Jane Field, and you'll get a step towards finding. They're very, very, very useful as the newspaper records. And that was the other Bailey, the other guy that died at Crady Quarry. We found him as well. He's in the Western section, so we managed to match the two of them up, which is quite nice. And that's a granite stone. So that's lasted very well. You notice that in cemeteries, um, I had imagined that sandstone was a kind of cheaper, more affordable option. But a lot of sandstone monuments don't fare quite well to the elements and you lose a lot of the... We've got a good contact in the Southern Acropolis called Stuart Craig. He's a monumental, mate, monumental sculptor. And Stuart's gave us a lot of insight into kind of the, the history and the kind of different materials, etc., for monuments. This is where a big famous man for the gatehouse. The architect that designed the gatehouse of the Southern Acropolis, Charles Wilson. He's a, he's a resident of the Southern Acropolis in the central section at the back left quarter. And this is his grave that we recently dressed, we managed to dress it up. We got a donation of roughly a hundred <laughs> roughly. 100 bags of white stones from a friend of ours whose partner had a builder's yard and he phoned us one night in November a couple of years ago and said, Colin, I've got a few bags of white stones I want ready from my yard. Would you like them? And we went, that'd be quite nice. And we went down in November about nine o'clock at night. It was freezing. It was actually snowing a wee bit. And we we're waiting in this wee van coming to meet us at the gatehouse. And this big van comes along. And Big James comes out the van, and the, ba the van was full of the big ton, four, four of the big ton bags and loads of plastic bags of stones. So we basically filled the gatehouse up with white stone. We couldn't get in it after that. And we used them all, and we've managed to do... That took about... This grave took about, I think, about 50 bags or 60 bags of stones. So it came in quite handy. And this is the gentleman here. Uh, he designed the gatehouse to sell on the crop. His father was a builder, and Charles Wilson served his apprenticeship while working for another great Glasgow architect, David Hamilton. He worked with Hamilton in the conversion of the Cunningham Mansion into the Royal Exchange, which is now the Goma. And he was also famous for other buildings as well. The Great Eastern Hotel, the Goma, as I said, the Rutherglen Town Hall, and the Southern Necropolis. Uh, our wee gatehouse is standing. It's quite sad looking at the moment. If any of you do the Euro Millions, I'm just putting this in, I always mention it. And he's happened to win 80, 85 million or a few million. We need two million for our gatehouse. <clears throat> so if you could take a note of that, I would give you my bank account. <laughs> but fingers crossed we'll get funding one day. We'd love to see it restored because we're losing too many classic buildings in the city. I'm sure you would agree with that. And another famous character that many people know his name but don't know where he's buried is Sir Thomas Lipton. You can still get his tea today, Lipton's iced tea, I've got it in my fridge, my favourite flavour's peach even though um, Sir Thomas Lipton was spinning in his grave there's only 0.14% tea in it, the sad things you do for research but it justifies it to call it tea, 0.14% I think that's basically a drop in the bottle but it's, a, it's lovely, so he's born in the Gorbals, Lipton became a multi-millionaire and is remembered as a special and much loved character of the Queen Victoria's reign his parents came from County Monaghan in Ireland and he was born at Crown Street Gorbals in 1850. His birthday was the 10th there. His birthday was just there, actually. And we're going to drink a wee cup of tea on Saturday at his grave to toast him, to um, remember the man. The Australian, and he was born in a close in the Gorbals, which was nicknamed Millionaire's Close because three people from that close became millionaires. The Australian editor and multi-millionaire Kennedy Jones was born in the same close and living across the landing from Lipton were the Dick brothers who became pioneers of retail shoe shops in the United Kingdom. A lucky close, right enough. 
and he made his first millions by the age of 30 after less than 10 years trading. I love the man. He's amazing. And I do so many mentions in my talks. You can make a move out of the guy. Uh, way ahead of his time. He used to walk, walk pigs through the street with ribbons and their tails and bells on them and let the kids clap them and stop the traffic, basically. And he's in articles in the newspaper for, and it got him in the papers, basically, for advertising. And he would tell people that they're Lipton's orphans and he would take them to the orphanage. But the, unfortunately for them, the orphanage was up in Duke Street and it was the, the abattoir, basically. But amazing man. So many great ideas for advertising, what he did way, way, way ahead this time. In fact, my wife used to watch the Victoria um, drama and one of the episodes in it, Lipton's in it, Queen Victoria was wanting to set up a big event to give food to the homeless on the grounds of Buckingham Palace, if I remember rightly. And she couldn't get anybody to come up and start the ball rolling with money. And who do you think steps up with a cheque for a couple of hundred quid? Sir Thomas Lipton. Yeah, yeah, I'll start the ball rolling. Wee man for the Gorbals just made his, made his mark in the world in so many ways. There he's there. There the man there. He was well noted for his dicky bow, his sailor's hat, and sleeping in his shop, which my granny used to tell me when I was a wee boy. And I used to laugh. I said, Granny, even as old, he didn't sleep in his shop, but he did apparently. Some nights he would work late and he would lie in the shop. And because he got a lot of experience from America when he travelled there as, as a young man, he used to leave his lights on through the night. And a lot of shops would think, that's not a very good idea. But it made his mark. And it, 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 it was noted as being like a beacon in the, in the night. So he, he had lots of lessons he learned from America. Uh, this is his grave there. This is two members of the Friends of along with myself. It's Charlie and Elizabeth, and we dressed up his grave as well. So he's part of our heritage trail as well. So again, if he's come, when he's come for a visit, he'll get a heritage trail to keep as well. There's lots of good wee biographies in it too. Other characters from the Southern Metropolis. John Robertson, who designed the engine for the steamship Comet. Christina Bayless and James Bayless from the Scotia Music Hall and Theatre Royal. James Anderson, Southern Acropolis Superintendent. And Thomas Bowen Seath, the Clutha Shipbuilder from Rutherglen and Partick. And a lot of the kids, we did a school project once, and a lot of the kids would be asking me questions like, Colin, how come a lot of the men you show us that were boat builders and shipbuilders, they all had beards? And one wee boy said, maybe it's because they're cold in at the water. So maybe that's why they'd beards, but that's that's Thomas Bowen Seath, great character, really interesting life that they led. And Glasgow's other famous architect. If my wife was here, she would tell you I've always got a wee chip in my shoulder about everybody goes on about Charles Rennie McIntosh. I used to always say, you're not noted as an architect in Glasgow unless you've got your design on a on a on a, a coaster or a t-shirt. But this is Glasgow's other famous architect, as we have many, as you know. So this is Alexander Greek Thompson. This is a monument in the western section. It's a like it or don't like it section. I could, if I could see, you could give me a thumbs up, thumbs down. It's grown on me. I like it. It's it's there. It's not going anywhere. It was unveiled in 2006, assembled by Watson Stonecraft. Star on it represents eternity, and his surname's there. There are steps here as well. The three steps. They've got a, a Masonic. Uh, symbolism as well on it too. It's, I like it. One of the children for the school project said he thinks it looked like a flat screen telly. But I, th I think Greek Thompson would have liked that kind of comparison. I don't know. This was the original model that was brought down. They were going to originally have the Greek band on it, but they ran out of money, basically. There was a lot of organisations, including Glasgow City Council and other architects. Companies chipped in money to get the £16,000 to kind of get the monument set up. And every so many weeks, it gets a wash. And that's me taking my turn. We all take our turn in the group. And we've got squeegees on it as well. We give it a wee wash and uh, with warm water. And we just like to look after it, basically. And you can stand inside it and get your photograph taken. You get a three-headed reflection, like a kind of Doctor Who effect. And it's really good for your, your Facebook profile if you're looking for something different. You'll see it when you come down. This is a circle that we set up next to Alexander Greek Thompson. This is the first day we did it. At the end of that day, we thought to each other, was this a good idea or no? Because any that do turfing, it, it does your back. I think my back was sore for about two weeks after doing that. But it was evolving. It's a circle of life. We started putting a, a board around it. We put wild meadow seeds on it. 
and we ended up with this. We got local schools down for a project and took them around for a walk. And wild meadow, butterflies and bees and mini beasts. It turned out really nice. But then the beasts from these came along and basically killed it all off. And we tried succulents. We got some funding from the Gobbles Ideas Fund for this little feature in it. And then we put some cobbles around it, which were reclaimed cobbles for the Gobble streets that we got from a local housing company. These were actually off the old streets to the Gobbles in Oatlands. We've got a plaque donated from a monumental sculptor, Lipton's, no, no relation to Sir Thomas. And this is what it looks like today. We put stones on it and it's the wild cherry trees actually get more, more kind of like uh, pink blossom on it than in this photograph. Franciscan Corner is an area that we've, de we've designated to remember the Commonwealth War dead. We use more of the cobbles. The group's done this as well. And we do it every year on Remembrance Sunday. We come up, we go up to the back and we remember the war dead in the cemetery. And that's us working on it. And that's for one of the commemorative days with the soldiers we did as well. And that's what it looks like at the moment. It's, it's turned out a really nice wee corner. For, a wee corner for reflection and just going up for a wee walk. Franciscan Circle was another funded area. We do a lot of, we can't look after the whole cemetery, but we've got good lays well with Glasgow City Council and we look after enhancement areas. And this is a Franciscan circle where the 20 skeletons have been reinterred from the Franciscan order. 12 male, seven female, and one sample of skeleton that they couldn't determine whether it was animal or human. And we, there's 60 bags of stones in that circle. And it's good for the kids that come down. I say, well, 60, how many is in each quarter? And a lot, most of them get it right. So it, it's an ongoing project, but we've did not a bad job on it. And the group's really well, really dedicated to the work that we do and enjoy doing it as well. The future is still on the Acropolis, like all cemeteries. It's good to get something to give it a life again, pardon the pun. We work with the schools, local schools, Resurrecting History Project. Stuart Craig came in, local stone monumental sculptor, stonemason, and he showed the children how to carve their initials into Italian marble. It looks a lot easier when Stuart does it. Stuart got a good, a good laugh at me trying to chisel a letter C in it. And he took the chisel off and he says, Colin, you're going to break that. I'll show you. And when Stuart does it, it's like a knife going through butter. And that's my niece, Nicole. She's 22 now. That's her there when she's three and a half at the White Lady. But you can now see the White Lady if you come down. Hannah and Nathan are our Duke of Edinburgh Award students who have been doing Duke of Edinburgh stuff with us for the past year and they've loved doing it. And that's a local school in Govan Hill that we worked with. Kids love cemeteries. They love talking about dead people and skeletons. Especially one wee boy that wanted me to move. Colin, can I ask you a question? I said, yes. See that grave of Sir Thomas Lipton? See if we move the big granite bit. Will we see his skeleton? I went, no, come on, let's go. Ask me another question. Children don't care. They just hit, They just strike from the hip. And it's always good to have them on board. This is our project again. This is our lucky mascot, Jackula, the Gorbo's vampire. And Christina Quarrell was a... A poet, poet and artist that we know came into the schools and did some language and um, creative writing sessions with the children. Because we've got Hugh McDonald who did Rambles Round Glasgow, but he did it. We've got cousins of, uh, nephews, sorry, of Robert Burns as well in the Southern on the Croppers. Gobbo's Vampire, if those of you who heard about it, 1954, 150 children turned up at the Southern on the Croppers looking for a vampire who was seven feet with iron teeth. Uh, they turned up at the cemetery with crucifixes, garlic, the usual vampire stuff, and pen knife for some reason, thinking they can get somebody that's immortal and attack him with a pen knife. Jimmy, and this other gentleman here, Jimmy was a member, is a member of our group. He was one of the kids that was there that day, and he climbed over the wall at Lawmore Street. He wouldn't be able to do it now because he's got a bad back, but he wouldn't do it because it's not a safe thing to do, but he did it then as a child, and we got on the one show and it was reenacted by a group of drama student, drama uh, kids. It was so good to see it getting flagged up again. A graphic novel has been brought out about the vampire as well. A gentleman called David Lucarelli from America. And I managed to get a mention in the comic. My wife was like that day. I spoke to the guy online. Don't ask him. I said, David, could I get a wee mention? In Glasgow, it means a mention in the comic book. So he gave me a full page. And I'm a letter picker. And I've opened it. There's a tomb line opened, and I'm on the phone. Man, Magnus, we've got a problem. 
So the vampires escaped. We don't have tombs in the cell on the Acropolis. That's artistic license. He just added that in uh, for effect. But it's good to keep the keep the legend alive. And there he's there. This is the god vampire revamped. I think he's been on steroids. He's seven feet two. He wears a kilt and he's got iron teeth. I wouldn't want to bang into him. Uh, and every Halloween, the children's vampire hunting brigade turn up at the cell on the Acropolis to make sure the vampire stays where he was put back. And I know where he is, but I'm not telling you. This is what we do to keep the cemetery alive as a green space. And it's a very, very important uh, resource to the community to bring people together, especially during and after COVID. We do health walks in it. We do yoga sessions where I have actually been photographed lying in my back for half an hour. My wife's no one, so she'll no laugh. For half an hour without talking. And it's very, very... It's strange to lie there, but it's really nice because you hear the birds, etc. And Claire is our yoga teacher. We're doing one for the summer solstice, if he's wanting to come down. It's celebrating the circles of life. We do yoga at the Franciscan Circle, then we walk through to Greek Thompson's Circle, and we've got an acoustic group called the Strum for Life, and we bring back songs of family members who've passed away, or songs that just rekindle thoughts. You know how a song comes on, you remember somebody. So we do a wee session, you get a wee cup of tea as well. Children have helped us in the past to save our gatehouse, and so has the Children's Vampire Hunting Brigade. Henry Ponciano, the artist for the comic book, did this one-off drawing of the Vampire Brigade holding the banner as well to help us save it. We need two million pounds, as I've noted before, if just in case somebody wins. You never know. <laughs> Teamwork makes the dream work. Very, very blessed by meeting these people. Our group are fantastic volunteers. And we would be lost without them. Um, every one of them does their bit. Myself and my wife Elsie, Charlie and Elizabeth, and we've got Jimmy, Nathan, Hannah and George and Bill, etc., who help us out. And a lot of people from the community join in as well. We just recently got a new notice board. We get funding from the Grobo's Ideas Fund. We've got a wee hook here for any lost property and a wee box that's got trails in it. If any of you come down yourself, lift the box up, and if I'm keeping my job going with my volunteer, there should be trails in there. If no, the group will tell me off, so just let me know, but there should be trails in it. So I'd like to finish, and I hope you've enjoyed it, but first of all, before I finish, just to hold one of these up, a couple of these, I'm not do them all. The burial books are selling the crop is give you causes of death. We've got approximately 160 uh, recorded uh, different ways of, ways of dying, basically. Some of them can relate to uh, occupational deaths, which is quite good for genealogy. This one is, this if I get it there, is suit what? I've actually patented this idea, so don't go stealing it for Dragon's Den. <laughs> suit what? Somebody that works in chimneys, a chimney suite or what Nicole works or Colliery works. You get what's in your mouth due to the soup and the heat. You've also got black spit which was Collier Works as well. A lot of people back then obviously worked. Health and safety was a big thing back in the day, and a lot of people breathed in a lot of stuff that they shouldn't. One of my favourite ones, if you have a favourite cause of death, which came up in the video books, was nostalgia. In brackets, died of a broken heart. Now, I've read this. Somebody that's went away abroad and sort of lost somebody, whatever, and they want to come back to Glasgow or whatever, Billy Conley always says the Scots have got a habit of recording songs about wanting to come back to stay in Scotland and how much they miss it. This is a recorded cause of death, nostalgia. One that you can think about is screws, which is known as arthritis. Tightening the screws up in your joints of your body so that they're stiff for you to open your fingers, etc., bend your knees, so that was screws. And another one, which I'll finish with, was kinkers. Have a wee thought. Dot, what do you think kinkers could be? Kinkers is hooping cough. You get into a kink, you can't stop coughing. And believe it or not, I worked in the early years. Four or five years ago, hooping cough was starting to come back. So that's kinkers. So lots of burial books are fascinating and they're, they're a great record and so many things in the Mitchell Library and libraries that we're so blessed to have. And again, if you get a chance to come down in the future to sell on the Acropolis, I hope you can come down and see us. We're doing my tour talk in the cup. I can let Claire know uh, the Celebrating the Circles of Life and we do a thing in November. The Absent Friends um, 
organisation do it for uh, palliative care all over Britain. And we do a Always and Forever event in November. You can come down and we get the guitars with the group. We sit and bring photographs of family members. We put wee mentions on my memory tree or wee hearts as well. It's a great event. But anything to kind of flag up the importance of the Southern Acropolis and as a green space for the community. So I'd like to finish my talk by saying, Southern Acropolis, there is life in the city of the dead, and I hope you enjoyed my talk. Thank you so much. Colin, that was amazing. Thank I can you. see where you I can see where you get your nickname from. I've been sitting with a smile on my face. All right, well, it's it's one of the things, I mean, I, I'm not an academic by any means, but I've been connected to the Southern Acropolis for about 35 years, and I got into it through my teacher. And she uh, taught me so many things. And she told me, I went to a meeting once with her with all these academics, and I said, Charlotte, I can't get in here. I don't know, but she said, Colin, you talk for there. Uh, you talk for there, and you know what you're And it's you, you develop it. You know yourself with research. Everyone is as a historian. We've all got stories to tell, and it's and we need to remember these things. It's very, very important. Yeah. And, I mean, even when you said, you know, sitting to 2 o'clock in the morning, doing research, I think we were pro probably all nodding our heads at that point because yeah. I'm sure there's most of us do that. I tell my yeah. wife that when she shouts in, come on, get your bed. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want you to just stop sharing your screen for a wee minute? Yeah, well, um, so, yeah, so Brian said that was great, Colin. Most of my Glasgow relatives were in, are in Craigton Cemetery, but I'll, I'll keep looking, he said. Um, Dennis says, excuse the pun, but that was pure dead brilliant. Like it. <laughs> uh, Diane says amazing talk thank you, Doug says thanks for that and for your support in the past um, Dot says thank you Colin so much that was a wonderful talk um, if anyone has any questions um, we can certainly ask them just let me know, you can put it into the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask No one yet. You can pop a note into the chat. It's uh, still time. I would just like to say that I think, you know, it's amazing how it started off being a cemetery project to sort of preserve the history that's there. And pardon the pun, it's sort of grown arms and legs and became a really big community project and also encouraging the kids to get involved. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, it really is amazing how it's developed and we, we, so we many like, We've uh, developed it. We, it's a cemetery and it's in the middle of this, it's the Gorbo. And we do get young visitors coming in, especially during the summer, etc. And we've developed the ethos. We speak to them. We know them. We know them first name basis. And if they come in, and I know people at my age group who used to go to the gravy. Some people call it the Oxo, by the way. Gravy. Get it? Aye. And I used to, they used to say, I used to get in there when I was a teenager and a wee drink. I says, but I, I've spoke to them, Claire. I says, look, I can't tell you to move. This is your turf. You've been in here more than I am. Mm. Just look after it. And we've did an intervention project with the police and we spoke to the, the teenagers. So we're kind of on a good path. And we like to keep it that way. I mean, we respect them, they respect us, if you know what I mean. Aye. So, I mean, I take it the cemeteries sort of no longer kind of under the umbrella of the council or the cemeteries office anymore. No, it's there, it's, it's bereavement services. It's their, it's their that... cemetery in Glasgow City Council cut the grass. We look after the grass at the entrance, but um, Bill, one of our group members, he's got, a, he's got his own business, he's got a van, and he brings, we've got a lawnmower, hey, we're posh, <laughs> and he brings it down, it's a petrol one, and he just, he does a wee bit at the entrance, but Glasgow City Council will cut the grass, and any wee things we need done, and Steve, head the parts, and we've got good links with that, and, and we've always had that, yeah, and again, the last bit was in 2007, so if you find an ancestor in it, it's got a plot, you can basically, if there's room in it, you can get buried in it. Oh, wow. I found that entry that I was telling you about. Um, I'll just actually share it. Why not? Yeah. So this was actually from microfilm at the Mitchell Library. So it's this entry here. So it was Thomas Oliphant, 3 Gildry Court. It right. runs over several pages. Just tell me if it, if it moves. I should have moved to the next yep. page. Yep. So he died of Scarlatina. Right. Um, he's one year and eight months. Wow. He, that he was the son of, and it was in 1857. Huh? Son of James, and I think the last. So that's it's the western section. Oh right, it's okay. Layer oh, one four two one four. One four two one four. Right, the the western section always kind of gives us a wee bit of grief because it's quite 
But again, as Bill, our group members being in running, Bill's been starting to take, he takes a wee book with him, and if he finds any wee learn them, because a lot of the stones have got learn numbers on them, but a lot of them don't. Mm -hmm. But that's no problem. But if you, I'll get that details from it, and we'll have a wee, we'll have a wee look about. I don't know. That's fine. I'll maybe just email it to you, and I'll Aye. for one of your wee trips and have a wee look. Yep. I'm quite. There's nothing better when we see when I find a stone. I mean, people must look at me and think, "What's he? What's he found new?" I get so excited. I'll go. I, I actually, I don't talk to myself. I'll be honest. My wife knows this. Sometimes I get into the cemetery. I don't know what you believe or no, and I will verbally say, "Right, give me this. I'm looking for somebody. Give us a hand here." And I don't believe in coincidences. I've walked and done stuff. I had a robin fly down once in the winter when it was snowing. This is the, the truth. Believe it or not, it's my story, right? And I walked along this road and I was looking for it. It was covered in snow, right? And I couldn't see with anything. And this robin wouldn't move. It kept following me. And it sat in this bit. And I had my gloves on and I rubbed the snow off this stone. You know what happens? You rub snow off a stone. It leaves itself in the lettering. Uh, and it was the one I was looking for. Wow. <laughs> What's the odds of that? <laughs> But you know what they say about robins? They don't say something along the lines of whenever a robin is near or it's a, a loved one exactly. is near or something Aye. like that. Isn't it? There's a wee saying. They're quite, they're quite territorial wee birds, but I know. Mm -hmm. Robins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Oh, it's fascinating, it really is. So, um, yeah, I'll, what I'll do is I'll get some details off you from when the tours are and I'll post yep. them on the Matry House genealogy page and I'll do the same on Lanarkshire's as well. Not a problem. Yeah, I mean, let's keep in touch and, you know, if you've got any events coming up, you know, we can certainly, you know... Well, that's the trail you'll get when you come down. That's, that's our trail. Right, that's good. We've got great. a bit of stuff with some stuff in it, lots of biographies and things in it as well. Mm -hmm. So, again, you get a wee cup of tea and you get a sandwich and, again... A lot of folk have linked up for it, which is really good. And it's great to get people coming out. I mean, I did a lot of live kind of feeds during COVID and stuff, and it's people are starting to really meet up again, and it's great to get out there again. Brilliant. Yeah. And as I say, the weather's getting better as well, so why not? Aye, definitely. <laughs> why not visit a cemetery? I know, that's it. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. Well, thanks for having by the way, folks. Thank you so much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. No problem. And I'll, and I'll be in touch. Um, just before we finish up, let me just get my my details up um so the next webinar will be on thursday the 8th of may at 7 pm the speaker will be barry duncan of the cameronian museum in hamilton you can register for that now and let me just post some details into the chat box i've posted also in the chat box some of the the links that colin has spoken about um and you can actually um go and view their facebook um group uh, their website, which is got, I had a look at while you were on, actually, there's some some interesting bits of history in there, some lists of names as well, and I also put the Oatlands Memories um, group in there as well. I've applied to join them also. <laughs> I mean, Claire, I mean, you know, my wife's not here to stop, but see the Oatlands Memories. I I've, I set up when my, my, my mother was living. My mum passed away in 2012. She I was born in Oatlands. She loved it. See the amount of stuff it's on that for people that put photographs. I just it runs itself. I do monitor it, but see when a photograph is on the chat, just goes. I just sit back and say, right, fire away. And we've, and Danny Gill again. If you Google Danny Gill, a G I double L. Danny's a member of Oatlands members, and he wrote four books himself, all about Oatlands. Oh, right. And one about the well, three about Oatlands and one about the Gorbals. Danny Gill, and it's it's amazing what he's done, and he's he, he did anecdotes for people in our group. Saying, just imagine walking out your close in the Oatlands and tell me where your what shops you get by and who's stayed in your close. It's all stories like that. It's brilliant, mm -hmm. really good. It's kind of I don't know. I mean, if for anybody else, I think that's that's watching. I mean, it's I think you've given me that kind of drive, I suppose, to get back into looking at my Gorbals ancestors because oh, they've been a wee bit neglected recently. So yeah, I'm definitely going to. Well, there's another website uh, for Gorbals. If you look up deadfamousgorbals.org. Right. Okay. That's okay. one I set up, and it's got a few kind of well-known Gorbals characters, and some that are not so well-known. That's fab. That's fab. Um, I'll put that into the, the chat box as well. Um, let me just see if I can find the link, and we'll put it onto the, the live stream. Uh, the the archive.org one is uh, it's an amazing website. It's um, the stuff that's on it, Claire. If I don't know if you've been on it, I do. I do use it. I am. Um, Millions I, of stuff on it. Aye, it's really good. So Dead Famous Gorbals. So that's got the one with Tommy Smith on it? Yes. Right, okay, let me just put that in. Tam Smith is a Gorbals vampire hunter as well. Tam passed away a few years ago. He's a good friend of mine. 
So if anybody comes across anybody that they've been researching themselves, get in touch. Oh, I definitely. Yeah, that'd be great. I actually did a presentation with a lady that sells tea, and she did a presentation for me on Sir Thomas Lipton. Oh, cool. So um, I'm going to speak to her and send her the, the link to your presentation, and then I can yep. probably pass through the details as well. So you Brilliant. can kind of link, um, link up, because she's been doing a wee bit of research into him as well. Good stuff. Great. That'd oh, be great. Good. That's great. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. No, I look thank forward you. to catching up with you soon. And for everyone else, thank you so much for attending and we look forward to seeing you next month. Take care and have a good day. Take weekend. care, folks. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye.